Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Today we are bringing you a special wildlife report on shark behavior, during which a scientist deliberately provokes shark attack while riding in this small underwater vehicle called a wet submersible. The SOS means Shark Observation Submersible, and from inside it, he will carefully observe the actions a shark exhibits just before it charges in to strike. This unique experimental craft allows the diver to enter the realm of dangerous sharks and observe them with greater safety than a free-swimming diver would have. Our report today comes from an atoll in the Marshall Islands of the Western Pacific. This is Eniwetok, famous as an atomic testing site a few years ago, and well known today among marine scientists as the location of the Mid-Pacific Marine Laboratory. We were invited here to observe the exciting research being done at Eniwetok Atoll by a team headed by one of the world's pioneer authorities on shark behavior. Dr. Donald R. Nelson, professor of biology at California State University, Long Beach. We've been studying the behavior of the gray reef shark, a dangerously aggressive species. This shark is quite social, and in order to observe interactions between members of the pack with safety, we had to develop a new type of wet submarine. We call it the shark observation submersible, and Bob Johnson has been responsible for building it. But, First, we will have to find the pack, and to do that, we will use a special type of ultrasonic transmitter. The transmitter, developed by Dr. Nelson's research team, can be tracked underwater with this receiver. It has the capability of determining both the direction and the distance to the shark. We are approaching our rendezvous with the other team members. So, we will get ready for the first dive. Our rendezvous is with two of Dr. Nelson's assistants from Cal State Long Beach, Greg Pittinger and Jim McKibben. Our diving today will be both free swimming and in underwater vehicles. Bob Johnson, also a Cal State biology student, will be assisting in the launching and recovery of the special one-man wet submersibles, such as this one, which I'll be using later on. Jim, who helped develop the telemetry equipment, activates the ultrasonic transmitter. Inaudible to the human ear, its signal is sensed through bone conduction. The transmitter is inserted inside a parrotfish, which a shark will swallow. Fluorescent red tape helps in recovery of the unit on the bottom after it's regurgitated by the shark several days later. The opening is sewn shut, so there will be no chance of the transmitter falling out as the shark swallows the bait. The signal from the hidden transmitter is inaudible, but we'll be able to pick it up with special ultrasonic receivers. A basket of fish put overboard will attract sharks to the transmitter rigged bait, which will hang beneath the boat on a line. With everything now in readiness, Dr. Nelson and I will dive. We're each armed with power heads for defense against shark attack. And as soon as we're in the water and get our bearings, we head for a nearby reef, which Don knows sharks frequent and which will afford us some protection while we observe them. Don checks the ultrasonic receiver and finds it working properly. There's a gray reef shark already aware of us. It is not surprising to see some others nearby since the species is social. They have obviously been attracted to our presence. Don has never encountered organized shark packs right here at this vertical reef drop-off, but he believes that a telemetered shark might lead us to just such a pack. The gray is often highly aggressive toward divers. This one, while not overtly aggressive, is approaching uncomfortably close. The gray reef sharks are most recognizable by a uniform gray dorsal fin and black fringed tail.
Whenever a shark moves in too close, Don wards it off, using the power head as a prod instead of a killing weapon. That large gray reef shark is about six feet long and swims with majestic unconcern. However fearsome it is, one has to admire its smooth gliding grace. The parrotfish bait containing the ultrasonic transmitter emitting its high frequency sound is attached by a cotton breakaway line to a weighted cord. This bait suspended below the surface is sure to entice the sharks. Some of them now appear to be detecting the scent of the bait and they're heading toward the fish with the transmitter inside. A gray reef shark takes the bait, stimulating a response from a large silver tip. Now we can return to the boat as the shark which has swallowed the transmitter swims off. Back at the surface, we can track it from the boat and perhaps it will lead us to the pack we're seeking. In the surface boats, we followed the shark's movements for several miles plotting its home range. The ultrasonic signal broadcast from the transmitter in the shark's stomach was picked up by our sensitive receiver here at the boat. Now the signal being received indicates the shark has slowed considerably and we can better pinpoint its location prior to diving again to intercept and observe it. It's possible there's a shark pack somewhere below us now. Jim McKibben in the smaller boat carefully scans the area underwater with a staff-mounted directional hydrophone to ascertain the exact direction to the telemetered shark. As he locates the signal, he adjusts the gain, gets a good fix, and then indicates the underwater direction that we should follow. While Marlin and I begin our dive, the yellow sub will be lowered to the bottom here for use in case we have to go a considerable distance and for protection should we encounter any aggressive sharks. Now we can start our underwater search in the direction Jim indicates. With the use of telemetering techniques, we can now unlock many of the mysteries of shark behavior which man was unable to comprehend before. Now we are able to monitor day and night when sharks travel, where they go, patterns of pack behavior, and other factors which, until the advent of telemetry, were only speculation. This coral-encrusted giant clam we've encountered is one of the largest I've ever seen. They can reach 400 pounds and are hazardous to a diver whose foot or hand might inadvertently become caught as it closes. The pulsating siphon draws in water and in this way the clam obtains its oxygen and minute organisms as food. We're almost to where the sub is waiting for us now, so I'll rise a little here and take a brief directional check on the telemetered shark. At the place where the yellow submersible is located, Greg waits to assist us. This submersible is built as small as possible for maneuverability, so space inside for me to sit upright to operate it is limited. Therefore, it is impossible to wear my air tank. It must be removed and stowed inside. This sub is designed basically as transportation and is not so streamlined, swift, or maneuverable as the specialized one that Don will be using. As soon as I get settled in the sub, I'll sit here a while as Greg gives me a brief refresher on its controls and operation. Then I'll take a trial run. Since Marlin and Greg will be occupied for a while, I'll take another reading on the telemetered shark before heading for my own sub. The signal is coming in quite clearly. And up ahead, there's a shark. Though it's in the general direction of the signal, it may not be the telemetered one. A shark alone like this could suggest territorial behavior, since it's beginning to threaten. 
The signal being received indicates the telemeter shark is in that direction, but that it is 68 meters distant. This one's too close to be our shark. The one we are after is beyond our visibility. I'll keep clear of this one threatening nearby. Whether or not any sharks are territorial is questionable. We just don't know enough yet. Since this is not our telemetered shark, and the signal is receding, I'll head back to where Marlin is now beginning his practice run in the submersible. We'll need the subs now to overtake the telemetered shark, so I'll go and get into my own sub. When I arrive at the boat, Bob immediately begins lowering the shark observation submersible on specially designed launching rails. This is the craft which I'll be operating as we search for the telemetered shark. To simplify entry, the SOS is suspended by a tether beneath the boat. Unlike Marlin's more conventional submersible, in this streamlined model, the diver must operate it while in a prone position, and he gets his air supply from a built-in tank. Marlin's submersible is quite maneuverable, but less specialized than the SOS, which is designed for both greater speed and maneuverability, facilitated by the controls built directly into the front of the craft. The half-inch thick plexiglass dome is strong enough to withstand attack by gray reef sharks, and at the same time provides me with excellent visibility. The dome is clamped in place from the inside for easy release in case of emergency. Now we're all set to go. As the tether rope is released, Don puts the SOS into motion. Soon he's passing me, and with that, we're on our way to find the telemetered shark, and hopefully, the shark pack. For safety's sake, because of my unfamiliarity with the operation of the yellow submersible, Dr. Nelson suggested I take the lead so he could keep me in view as we headed for the shark we were following. There's a great exhilaration in traveling this way underwater, as if one were flying low over the terrain of a very beautiful but alien world. The area we're moving into now becomes deeper as we pass over the coral formation just below us, but we won't pause until a shark is in sight. We're moving along on a straight course now, in the direction of the signal from the telemetered shark. Up ahead, we finally encountered another shark. As previously arranged, I'll stop here and observe as Don takes the lead to determine if this is the shark with the transmitter. I'll move ahead and land in the next clear area so I can check the signal. Here's a good place to stop. As soon as the receiver is activated, it becomes clear that this is not our shark. The signal received indicates that the telemetered shark is still farther ahead, just beyond the next ridge in deeper water. 
Marlin will now follow along behind, keeping me in sight, but maintaining a substantial gap between us. I'll land on the crest of this coral ridge, right at the edge of a steep slope. The telemetered shark should be just below me. There's the pack, and according to the signal, our telemetered shark is in it. It's a large circling pack of 30 or 40 individuals, and oddly, they seem to be ignoring my presence. Others are approaching in a regular procession to join the pack. Following one another this way is a type of social behavior differing greatly from the loose aggregation we witnessed earlier. Why they form such circling formations is still a mystery, but these observations may provide an answer. To my right, above me, is a shark which seems somewhat aggressive toward me. There are, in fact, several sharks up here which appear uninterested in joining the pack. Early research with a colleague, Richard Johnson, would indicate that by moving in relatively close, we may be able to stimulate a threat display and possibly trigger an attack. This is the one we'll follow. Aware of us, it is becoming agitated, and closer pursuit is likely to cause a full threat display. With the SOS coming closer, the threat intensifies. This is called agonistic display, a deadly warning characterized by tense, exaggerated swimming motions, arched back, lowered pectoral fins, and often a head-up attitude. Attack may occur if I move in closer. Here comes an attack. It happened with unbelievable speed and the shark is continuing its agonistic display. That strike on Don's sub seemed much too brief to have been really damaging, but it would have been devastating to an unprotected diver. The hull of the SOS has been severely scarred by the shark's teeth. I'll circle for another try. Other sharks are still swimming here seemingly unaffected by what occurred. I'll select another shark now for a test approach. Immediately as I near it, the shark reacts. Once again, agonistic display becomes very severe. That shark's attack disabled one motor, and the situation here is suddenly more serious than expected. With only one motor operating, I've managed to get the SOS going again, but it's badly off balance, and we must head for safety immediately. Don's compensating well for the damage now, and I'll follow him closely in case he needs assistance before reaching the boat. The SOS is moving slower and seems to be faltering. We're nearing the boat and it's a relief to see that Don has made it back safely. Our approach has been observed by Bob who is already waiting with the tether rope. The experiment was unexpectedly unnerving yet it provided valuable data on what provokes a shark into attacking, how the shark acts prior to the attack, and the incredible swiftness and savagery of the attack itself. That knowledge may well benefit other divers by helping them to recognize pre-attack shark behavior and perhaps avoid tragic results. Don now surfaces with the sub's plexiglass dome, and I get my first look at the damaged prop with one blade bitten off. A diver struck that way could have been fatally injured. Today's observations will contribute significantly to our scientific understanding 
of the dangerous sharks of any we talk. Man continually improves his own lot by learning more about the world in which he lives. Part of this knowledge stems from the work being done beneath the sea by such intrepid scientists as Dr. Donald Nelson. The films of an incredibly swift shark attack like this are important. Later on, the films can be analyzed in stages of stopped action like this, so that the scientists can clearly see and study the actions of a shark before and during an actual attack. Scientists believe such attacks are not motivated by hunger, but are defensive, with the shark regarding the sub as a predator or competitor. Whatever the case, in learning how to better anticipate shark behavior and possibly avoid attack, we can broaden our knowledge by studying them even more closely in their own realm of the wild kingdom.